Uh, Brad Stone wrote uh, definitively the biography of Jeff Bezos and Amazon and the story of Amazon called The Everything Story. And uh, Brad took the purview of what's the story of Amazon and why have they just utterly dominated everything that they've touched. And I can't wait to welcome Brad here on stage with us today. So thanks for coming. Thank you, Craig. You're the second Brad on stage today. So, uh, Well, I think we're going to spend a few minutes just, I'd love to, you know, we're transportation sure. folks, full of transportation folks. And there has been a lot discussed about Amazon. We just covered it, in fact, or just talked about it. Amazon entering the transportation space. And I'm wondering, have you, have you done any analysis on this? I, I've been looking at it, in part in, in preparation for today, but in part uh, I'm working on a new book about Amazon, and then I run the technology coverage at Bloomberg, and so their moves in logistics and transportation is something that we cover avidly. Got it. And so what, what do you think they're doing? Well, as they always do, right, it is their constitutional mandate to expand in every direction. Um, the everything store is becoming the everything company. But look, I mean, I think you can go back to 2013, the Christmas time. I don't know if you remember, Craig, but, you know, they kind of blew Christmas. Uh, the, a, a bunch of packages didn't show up on time. They blamed UPS. They got terrible press. Yeah, they had to send out gift cards, but part of, part of the problem was, and I think what they realized is that they had exceeded their partner's capability to keep up with their own growth. Got it. So I think part of what they're doing is sort of, you could call it defensive. You know, they're building capacity to increase the density into the neighbor, into the high density neighborhoods that they service. And then part of it is what they've always done, which I'll talk about in my speech, which is, you know, turn pieces of themselves outward to create platforms for their partners. It's, it's I, we, we had written, we've written a lot of it, I mean, Amazon's a couple of times a week, and most of it's sort of benign, just they've, they've talked about adding an aircraft or, or a drone or whatever. Some of it's more compelling and more provocative. We had received an email, we actually had written about your, you coming on stage, and we'd received an email and said, the description of that Jeff Bezos, uh, your margin is my opportunity, I think is a quote from you. Um, <laughs> you know, it's funny, I, I never used that in my book, and I never oh. verified that he said it, but it does represent that something that is obviously true at Amazon, that it's a low margin business, and can therefore be a danger to higher margin businesses. Got it. It was what, so we received an email from a former Amazon executive that's still in transportation uh, uh, in the space, uh, working for another uh, shipper, another company that ships stuff. And he had said that is sort of not the whole story, is that Amazon literally just does not want to run out of capacity. And the model is to overbuild, to, to your point, so that the packages are not late. And then what ends up happening is they just have a lot of capacity they have to sell off. Is that, is that? Yeah, that's exactly right. And I mean, I think, you know, if you look, look at the history of, let's say, the fulfillment center build out, you know, it's, you know, a dozen fulfillment centers 10 years ago. And they, they started this program called Fulfillment by Amazon. And, you know, it, you know, they've got a great challenge at that point in time. I'll talk about this, but they want to get much closer to their customers. They want to sort of fulfill the promise that they made with Amazon Prime, two-day delivery, and do it economically. And it costs a lot of money to build these 800,000, 1 million square foot warehouses. And by bringing in other uh, re uh, merchants to store their products with Amazon, they're able to finance the cost of doing that. So I have one more question, and then I'll let you get to your speech. If you're a competitor of Amazon or potentially a provider of logistic services to Amazon, how should you how should you think of them in the business? And how should you work with them or not work with them? I mean you're you're you've, you're defining the grand the grand questions of uh, of everyone in business that has to maneuver in Amazon's orbit. Um, you know, it reminds me, uh, Amazon itself was facing this question in the mid-2000s uh, with how it dealt with Google, right? It had to become a major buyer of AdWords on Google. It became the largest, I think, alongside eBay. It worked on ways to automate that process. And Jeff was saying something to the people uh, who were running that business at the time, and it was along the lines of treat Google like a mountain. You've got to climb it, uh, but don't try to move it. Use them, but don't make them smarter. Hmm. And I think that's, a, that's the right orientation for dealing with Amazon, too. Like, you know, they're an unavoidable partner. They're a platform for a lot of companies. But you need to protect your business, you know, and make sure that you have a unique selling proposition uh, to your customers. 
and be wary of the data that Amazon collects because as we know, they have a history of observing good businesses and then, and then taking the opportunity for themselves. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, so we had Brad Jacobs, who XBO, their largest customer was Amazon, and uh, I think $600 million in business uh, had been taken away. And so certainly, I mean, they're, they're big enough and they can insulate from that. But there was another uh, company, trucking company, in the Northeast called New England Motor Freight, which could not, they were union, they couldn't uh, uh, respond to the changes that Amazon had made on their network, and then the sudden disruption they had as they changed their network, they just couldn't respond, and they actually filed bankruptcy. 100-year-old company, and so. And I think that's the real lesson, which is that you know Amazon is a sort of bellwether for any industry it gets into. Not that they're gonna come and take your market share, but that it's gonna require additional investment among all players. So the arrival of a, of a hardcore technology player that will be rethinking the value proposition and investing in technology. And so if you have a business that's kind of encrusted with old customs, manual ways of doing business, that's the moment where you have to rethink, and it, it can be quite costly for smaller companies. So I guess the lesson here is don't have concentration. Like do, do business with Amazon such that you have other business and, and have contingency plans in case they You know, make sure you're not in a commodity business, that what you do has a unique selling proposition. You know, two, in, invent in your own business. Amazon's gonna be rethinking the, you know, the entire contours of, of your industry, so do that yourself. Invent the future you wanna see. That's kind of a, a calling card within Amazon, and you can't have some, a new player coming in and rethinking the value proposition and inventing new things and you stay the same. Well, Brad, I'm going to let you get to it, but thank, thank you, you so much for coming. So, Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Well, as Craig uh, mentioned, I am a journalist, uh, so th thank you for inviting me into your... Oops, sorry, Lisa, oh, yes. has, Lisa has an announcement. Before I get started, I want to give everyone an opportunity to hear what he says and be able to ask questions. So most of you received, or all of you, if you have the mobile app, should have received a notification. Uh, with a link to go ahead and submit a live question to Brad. So if you didn't get that, it's really easy to get to. Just go to your mobile app, click Agenda, click Bradstone, keynote speaker, and when you open it, you'll see live Q&A, submit a question. His questions will come up here on the screen. He'll be able to answer them when he's done with his presentation. Awesome. Sorry. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, so I'm a journalist. I run the technology coverage for Bloomberg. Uh, previously, I was a reporter at the New York Times, and before that, I was at... Newsweek magazine, uh, and I've written a book about Amazon called The Everything Store, although my preferred title is Bezosologist. Okay, what is Bezosologist? What is Bezosology? Bezosology is the study of change, okay? On the left, we see the kind of dweeby uh, Mr. Magoo from the late 1990s. Uh, that's the guy I first met uh, in an old vet hospital where Amazon's offices were in the late 1990s. He had a very uh, fast-growing book business. And the guy on the right who looks like uh, the star of an action movie is not The Rock. That is the CEO of one of the largest companies in the world. Um, and, and so this is the study of, of metamorphosis and change. Um, now, when I set out to write the first book, The Everything Store, in 2011, Bezosology was already becoming a multidisciplinary field. That's why I got interested in it. It, was, it had gone from book selling to general retail to enterprise computing. They had gotten into book, uh, book, digital book selling and, and digital book publishing. And I thought, you know, here's a company, a very secretive, uh, remote up in Seattle that hadn't got the proper amount of attention. And I went up to Seattle to, to talk to Jeff about the book project. And at the time, he looked far more like the guy here on, on the left than he did the guy on the right. And he said, uh, he, he, I, I, I wrote a press release for him because all proposals inside Amazon are done in the form of a press release. And so I sat across the table and I gave it to him. And he, he laughed his sort of hearty, uproarious, and slightly intimidating laugh. And, and he said it was, it was too soon to write the Amazon story, but he would cooperate nonetheless. And I was able to talk to Amazon executives and members of Jeff's family and Jeff himself a few times to write uh, the Everything Store. And you should know that when it came out, uh, Jeff's now former wife, Mackenzie, gave me a one-star review. So the book was not warmly embraced, but hopefully now seen in the fullness of time as an account of what has, was really a sort of contentious, tense, uh, but very eventful first 20 years of Amazon. 
Which brings me really to the last decade, uh, which has been, a, there's been just as much, if not more, change. Now, by the way, when, whenever you ask a journalist to do PowerPoint, you know, the results are sure to be hilarious. This is pretty much the best you're going to get from me today. Um, but, you know, the employee count up by a factor of 20 since 2010, um, you know, market cap and revenue dramatically increasing. U.S. Fulfillment Center is going from 19 to over 110. And, of course, Jeff Bezos' wealth, uh, he is now the wealthiest man in the world. And the asterisk there at the end of 118 billion, well, some of you who have followed the news lately probably understand what that means. The wealth has been slightly curtailed over the past few months, but he still remains the richest guy in the world. And this is what I've decided to write my next book about. It's the second chapter in Amazon's history, and I'm just starting that project. And part of it will certainly cover this, which is really your topic here today, which is the massive expansion in the Amazon transportation and logistics footprint, you know, not just in the U.S. from around the world and not just in fulfillment centers, but all, all, that, all that transportation, the, the airplanes they're buying, um, you know, the shipping containers they're leasing, the trucks, the last mile delivery, and the kind of threat that that poses to, to, fo to folks like you guys. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit now about how we got from there to here, you know, how Amazon went from a small group of people in a garage outside Seattle with an idea to now the company that's basically, you know, worrying almost everybody in, in business. So it starts, the Amazon story starts surprisingly on Wall Street at a, at a quantitative hedge fund called D.E. Shaw. Uh, Jeff Bezos was already in his late 20s an enormously successful executive. He was the youngest and, the, and, and one of the highest paid vice presidents at this quantitative hedge fund, D.E. Shaw. It was started by a guy named David Shaw, who was a computer science professor at Columbia. And, and David Shaw didn't think of D.E. Shaw as just a hedge fund. He th thought of it as a broad technology company whose first business was in trading. And that would actually uh, end up being significant because Amazon, frankly, never thought of itself as a book-selling operation. It also thought of itself as a broad-based technology company. Well, Jeff did a lot of things at D.E. Shaw, and in, in particular, he was responsible for researching new initiatives. And in about 1993, you know, David Shaw, this computer science professor, you know, saw this thing coming called the internet, and he asked his promising young lieutenant, Jeff Bezos, to go and research it. And Jeff pulled the research reports back at the time, and there were not many of them, and saw that this new internet protocol, the World Wide Web, was growing at, at leaps and bounds. I think the number he calculated was that it was growing 230,000 percentage points every year, and he thought to himself, you know, things that fat, things just don't grow that fast. This is a rem remarkable opportunity. Now, you know, there's a sense that, that Jeff Bezos must have loved books to start Amazon in the book business, and in fact, he does love books and has a huge, uh, in, in particular, science fiction book collection, uh, but it, he was actually much more analytical than that. He sat there in, in his office at uh, in Midtown Manhattan on the, on, the, uh, on the 54th floor and just started making lists of what, would, what, you know, what you could do on the internet. And actually there were a lot of brainstorming sessions inside D.E. Shaw at the time and a couple of different ideas came out. Uh, the idea of an online brokerage, you know, what we now know as an E-Trade or a Charles Schwab, one of those came out of D.E. Shaw, it was called Farsight Financial. Um, the, the idea of free web-based email, what we now know as Gmail or Yahoo Mail, one of those came out of D.E. Shaw, the result of these brainstorming sessions that David Shaw and Jeff Bezos initiated. Uh, but the third idea was this concept of an everything store. You know, could you use the internet to basically create unlimited selection? You know, could you be the intermediary between a manufacturer and a brand and, and a customer? And that's the idea that Jeff went to work on, and he created lists of basically of the kinds of products that you might be able to sell on this new thing called the World Wide Web. And he, he had clothes, office supplies, you know, CD-ROM, CDs, uh, VHS cassettes, that is, after all, 1994. 
Uh, but books were the one thing that jumped out at him, and because, you know, because they're perfect commodities, because a copy of one book that you buy in a store in Atlanta is the same as the copy of the book that you buy in San Francisco, and there were two distributors, just major distributors that was going to be relatively easy to supply. And so Jeff decided that he would sell books online. David Shaw got really mad at him. He said, you know, I asked you to research this for me, and you want to go do this on your own now. Uh, Jeff's mom begged him not to leave his, uh, his lucrative job, asked him if he could just do it at night and stay on Wall Street. Um, but Bezos was infatuated with entrepreneurs, uh, Mackenzie, his wife, was supportive, and they set out to start the company that became Amazon. Um, one important point to understand early Amazon, uh, you probably uh, know the saying that every fortune starts uh, with uh, with uh, a crime. Uh, in this case, I, I think it would be fair to say that enter, every internet empire starts with some slightly bent rules. And I think in the case of Amazon, Jeff studied the sales tax framework at the time. There was a Supreme Court ruling called Quill versus North Dakota that said you basically only had to collect sales tax in the places where you had nexus or a physical operation. And so he drove right by California and went to Washington State, slightly less populous, and set up shop in Seattle. So early Amazon, you have uh, the Bellevue house uh, where he started Amazon in his garage, uh, the very ugly homepage for Amazon.com, uh, and then door desks as a symbol of the company's enduring frugality. Uh, they would only use door desks and very spare office furniture. In fact, it was something, the, the value of frugality that he picked up from reading Sam Walton's uh, uh, autobiography. Um, they set up shop in a, in a small office eventually near what was the Kingdom. Uh, the, the first Amazon warehouse was in the basement. It was a former band practice studio and there was still the words of the band, Sonic, Sonic Jungle, that were spray painted on the wall. And, and Jeff himself drove the packages to, uh, to the local post office in his, in, his Honda, uh, in his Honda Accord. So there you go, that's the very first uh, Amazon, that's where the logistics empire starts with Jeff's uh, old Honda. And there's a story that Jeff likes to tell, which is that they're in, in that kind of dusty uh, basement room and they're packing up books with this self-adhesive cardboard and one of his early colleagues, they're on their knees and their knees are killing them and one of his, uh, one of his colleagues says, you know, uh, actually Jeff says, you know, what we really need are knee pads for this and the colleague says, well, why don't we get packing tables? And, and Bezos repeats that story all the time and to him it's this notion of always always simplifying the process, coming up with new things, and it's basically a value that is now infused throughout the organization. Um, so there are a number of ways to kind of tell the next 10 years of, of Amazon history, um, but I want to start, um, actually we're not there yet, I want to start with just, just giving you a blueprint of how, how kind of the fulfillment center, uh, the logistics kind of business grew. So, you know, they, they move out of, the, out of the basement and they build two warehouses, one's in Seattle and one's in Delaware. And they, they, they essentially, they don't know what they're doing at all. And they advertise in local papers saying, send us your freaks. They literally say that. And so you have these warehouses full of like punk rockers and out of work opera singers and, and you know, all, all sorts of random characters. And it, you know, it's a total mess. They can't keep up with Amazon's growth. Um, at the, you know, the first couple of holidays are a disaster. They have a program called Save Santa where every employee uh, from the Seattle office has, has to rush into the warehouses and spend their entire uh, holiday season basically helping to ship books. Uh, finally, in the late 90s, they hire a wave of, of executives from Walmart. And the Walmart guys come in and they create distribution centers, a handful of them across the country. Well, Walmart distribution centers are obviously unsuitable for the unique challenges of Amazon in terms of collecting a unique set of products and getting them to people's homes so the DCs don't work that well. And then a huge inflection point for Amazon is hiring a guy named Jeff Wilkie from Allied Signal. He's now the CEO of basically the consumer business at Amazon. 
Uh, he changes the DCs to fulfillment centers and basically rips out all the software, you know, comes to the, to the intuition that nobody is doing, has ever done, what Amazon's trying to do in these facilities. They write all their own code, they put all their own automation in there, and that's the beginning of Amazon finally mastering the chaos of its own logistics network. And I would say that's, that's been their biggest, biggest challenge all along. When you're growing at 40, 30, 25%, every year, you know, Amazon's biggest enemy has never been Walmart or eBay or Alibaba. It's always been solving for the chaos in their own operations, trying to figure out how to keep up with the growth and fulfill the promises they're making to customers. I'll tell you one quick story from around 2005, uh, the story uh, I love, which shows how they still, now 10 years into the company's history, hadn't really tamed the chaos. So this was in Coffeyville, Kansas. It was one of those first generation fulfillment centers. Uh, they had ripped out all, all, the, all the, uh, the Walmart software and customized their own. But that holiday season, a temp worker started showing up to the Coffeyville warehouse and they could see that he was showing up. But when they looked at the, basically the metrics about how much work he was performing and how well he was doing it, they couldn't find any sign that he was doing any actual work. And uh, the, um, the fulfillment center manager at the time, a guy named Brian Calvin, who I think is still at Amazon, you know, says, okay, I'm gonna solve this mystery. And he ends, up following the, he's, he ends up following the temp worker as he comes into the Coffeeville fulfillment center and then following him as he walks through the fulfillment center into the back where he has set up a little hovel for himself using packing crates, a little hut. And inside he had furnished it from products from Amazon's shelves. So he had everything. He had magazines and books and a nice carpet. He had completely set himself up. There was some food in there and he had been spending the holiday season basically in his little hovel. So even in 2005 during the holiday season, they still haven't quite tamed the chaos of their own fulfillment network. And yet, as if you're familiar with Amazon's history, uh, you know from a stock perspective, it was a, a rise, fall, and rise situation. They had almost been extinguished during the dot-com boom. Uh, the stock price went all the way into the single digits. Jeff Bezos was the only guy that still believed that this was possible. And if you look here at this, again, one of the best, you know, this is the best you're gonna get from me in terms of PowerPoint. And I should say that this is market cap you know, even in 2008, Google and, and e even eBay, investors are more optimistic about. Amazon, it almost seemed as if Jeff had picked the least interesting business model of a new age. So what happened? So I think right, at the, right in this time period, 2006, 2008, is the most fruitful time in Amazon's history. There's a kind of Cambrian explosion of new business ideas. And the way they got there is basically turning pieces of the Amazon empire into platforms. And now you're probably all familiar with platforms, you know, Windows being the kind of canonical one in technology, a sort of threshold for other businesses and developers to go and reach their customers. Um, and Amazon did this in basically three ways, all of them starting in this time period between 2006, 2008, when Amazon had recovered and mastered its own chaos, but in which the world was basically pessimistic about its business model and about the entrepreneurial capabilities of Jeff Bezos. So the first thing they did was AWS. So just as they had built out the fulfillment network, Amazon had built out you know, their IT infrastructure, and yet for many years it was a mess. And basically the complaint was that developers inside Amazon couldn't test anything. They couldn't run their experiments. And experimentation was hallowed at Amazon. And Bezos went nuts, you know, like why you come in here to this planning session and you say you haven't been able to test your new project. And the problem was that there was a kind of high priesthood of servers uh, that was in a different building, the Union Station building in Seattle, and were provisioning these computer resources, but basically had to be very conservative with them. And Jeff, you know, he, he, was, he was outraged. He said, developers are alchemists, and our job is to allow them to do their alchemy. You know, we need to, we need to uh, support their creativity. And at the time he was reading a book, it was by a video ga game designer named Steve Grand called Creation. I talk about this in my book, uh, where he talks about how the kind of creativity of evolution always starts with basic building blocks or primitives. 
And Jeff took that concept and he started brainstorming with his colleagues. Okay, well, what are the primitives that we can build to foster a kind of creativity, a spark from our developers? And they thought about storage and compute and messaging and payments. And they set up teams around these primitives and they sent them out into the world. The, the uh, compute team went to Cape Town in South Africa and ended up developing what became EC2. And the storage team took a top floor at the, uh, the old veterans hospital in Seattle and developed what became S3. And that service, as we now know, is Amazon Web Services. It did, I think, 25 billion in sales last year alone. It's growing at like a 45% clip. It's, it's larger than even a company like McDonald's. So one of the true successes and an example of how you know, Amazon was able to externalize a resource and provide it to other developers. And, and the, the board members at the time asked Jeff, like, why would we do this? This is not our business. We need to like, expand into different countries and other expand into different product categories. And Jeff basically said, well, we need this too. So the insight was that other developers would need it. And of course, it's become one of Amazon's biggest successes. The second platform move was fulfillment by Amazon. They took everything that Jeff Wilkie built and those fulfillment centers and they turned it into a resource for the sellers on their marketplace. Now what you see here is a story that I wrote in 2007 for the New York Times, desperately trying to explain this, not only to a broad audience, but to my editors. They were like, well, what do you mean Amazon's gonna ship stuff for other people? It was a completely bizarre notion at the time. But you know, two years before, they had launched a service called Amazon Prime, and that Prime was built on the, the development of a fast track technology inside the warehouses you know, that could deliver reliably within two days. And Jeff thought, you know, if we can do this reliably and if we can do it economically, then we should start offering that to our, to our sellers. And Fulfillment by Amazon, of course, has been a massive hit. In the latest shareholder letter, which maybe some of you saw, you know, Jeff said that third-party sales, I think, are now 58% of, of all uh, uh, the, the gross merchandise volume for physical goods. And he said third-party sellers are kicking our ass. And that's in large part due to the growth of fulfillment, fulfillment by Amazon. And by the way, in both of these cases, AWS, you know, the, the involvement of third-party developers fueled a massive expansion in Amazon data centers. I think there's something like 100 now around the country. They keep that number very quiet. I think, I think WikiLeaks a couple years ago published some numbers. And then fulfillment by Amazon, again, financed the end goal for Amazon, which was a density of fulfillment centers. We could go back to an earlier slide from 11 in 2007 all the way now to over 120 fulfillment centers, sortation centers, and delivery centers. So Amazon probably couldn't have gotten there itself, but by bringing in external partners to pay to use the service, they were able to. And then finally, the third platform developed around the same time, a device platform. Um, some of you are familiar with the story. Jeff saw Apple destroying the Amazon music business with the iPod back in the early 2000s. He correctly intuited that there was a danger to Amazon's core franchise, the book business, so he sparked development of the Kindle. His colleagues and other board members were incredulous. They said, we don't know anything about hardware. And, they re and he said to them, well, we're gonna have to learn how to do it. You know, the Kindle was a successful product. It didn't quite turn into a platform for third-party developers, although they tried, uh, and, and it didn't quite work. The devices were very limited. Uh, Jeff saw uh, iOS and Android taking off, so he spun up uh, the Fire Phone, one of the biggest disasters in, in Amazon history. The idea was to kind of fork Android and create a, a device with a 3D display. Uh, they took way too long to develop it. When it came out, nobody wanted to buy it. Um, but Jeff was adamant that it was a good bet. He says that failure and invention are inseparable twins, and you need failure along the way to create new things, and the problem with large companies these days is they're not willing to tolerate the failure that will come with getting to something that succeeds. And the best example of that is Alexa. Alexa starts by inquiries within Amazon to create a, basically a Siri-like voice function for the Fire Phone. And Jeff was so impressed with the effort that he said, let's do this as a separate product, a PC-based voice, uh, uh, a voice-based PC in the cloud. 
and that was the beginning of the Alexa project. They called it Doppler within Amazon, and now you have tens of thousands of developers writing programs for Alexa, just as tens of thousands of shippers use fulfillment by Amazon and developers use AWS. So I wanna get to your questions. Please start to send them to me. Uh, we talked a little bit about this already. Could logistics be the fourth platform play? I kinda already answered that question. I think the bottom line is yes, it's coming. You know, Amazon's shipping uh, costs are growing by leaps and bounds, so the first obligation will be to service its own customers. But to, Amazon wants to be everywhere. It wants to have vans running in your neighborhood. Uh, it wants to have airplanes and trucks moving between its fulfillment centers. And it wants to have ships going from its sellers and manufacturers in China to the US and to Europe. It, it can get there by itself. It will get there faster if it brings in third party uh, third-party sellers to use its own shipping services. So the things we're seeing now, like ship with Amazon, Amazon Flex, uh, the Relay app, all these little experiments. I, I completely believe that some will go away, but Amazon is experimenting on the road to finding something big that will help it with a long-standing goal of controlling the last mile, of vertically integrating, and of lessening its reliance. I don't think it will ever get off a, a UPS or a FedEx, but lessening its reliance on them. And we should also note that we have a president right now that's very skeptical about Amazon's relationship with one of its biggest logistics partners, the USPS. So you can look at uh, Amazon's shipping uh, ambitions as a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a guarantee against maybe unanticipated changes with some of its big shipping partners. And finally, the question, is Amazon a friend or a foe? What are its, its advantages? What are its disadvantages? I think one of its biggest advantages, frankly, is that culture of reinvestment, you know, that when it does find high margin businesses, it doesn't buy back stock or give the money back to investors in the form of a dividend, it invests in new businesses. So there's an other category in Amazon's financial reports. Advertising is included in that other category. I think it was around 10 billion in 2018. That money is going into Alexa. That money is going into the ghost store rollout to physical retail around the world. When Amazon finds a, a hit or a gusher of, of new sales, it reinvests in the business. Um, Single-threaded leaders. Amazon's the land of a thousand CEOs all running their businesses and running marketing and product management and engineering and then working with kind of matrix organizations like HR and legal. Um, there's an enormous amount of autonomy for people within Amazon. It's one of the reasons they're able to attract entrepreneurial people. And then as the first customer of any new business, they have this remarkable advantage of getting to scale quickly. And the disadvantage, Antitrust concerns, Amazon, like Google and Facebook, cannot stay out of the limelight now. Uh, is Amazon my partner or competitor? It's a huge problem now. When Amazon wanted to get into payments and move point of sale technology into physical retail, a lot of the third party retailers were just not interested. If there's any big challenge to AWS right now, it's that big companies, big retailers, they're going to Microsoft and Google, they don't want to work with Amazon. And finally, Jeff Bezos' long-term engagement. I'm going to a press conference in Washington, D.C., I think on Thursday, for his space company. He wants to put people in orbit. Uh, he wants to go to the moon. Uh, the extent to which he will continue to invest his time and attention at Amazon versus his personal projects, I think, is a sort of long-term question for the company. And with that, I'm going to go to these questions because there are a lot of them. Um, thank you guys for, for listening. Okay. Does, I'm just going to take the first one. Does Amazon pose a real threat to traditional 3PL? So, okay, I am not indigenous to the transport. 3PLs is like independent service providers, third-party shippers, broker, oh, the brokers. I see. Well, I mean, so, so like a convoy? Okay. Um, I, you know, they're experimenting clearly with this Relay app. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know that they have the focus of some of the older players or the newer upstarts. So do they, do they pose a threat? You know, certainly. But look, we, Amazon throws a lot of stuff against the wall. 
I don't see that being, when they move, as they move to being more vertically integrated, I don't see that as being a particular focus of their attention. Okay, my 28-year-old son is new to the transportation industry. He is currently a fleet manager with an economics degree. What career advice would you give? Uh, don't listen to journalists when they give you career advice, uh, number one. You know, I think, I think be a student of these, of these companies. Be a student of history. You know, I talk about Amazon history because I think it creates a map for where they're going. And so, you know, when you look at the new competitors like Uber or Amazon, understand the kinds of businesses they are, the flexibility they have to go make investments. One of the biggest challenges for traditional players is that their investors often don't give them the runway, so you gotta figure out how to get there if you're gonna compete fairly. Is Amazon starting their own private fleet? I mean, I think we, we see that, that they are, right? They've leased thousands of trucks. You've got Amazon Flex, Amazon. Sometimes I don't even know when I see an Amazon van in my neighborhood, is that an Amazon van? Is that a third party business that has leased the Amazon van? They clearly are. They're never gonna service all of their demand, but they're starting their own fleet to be able to you know, kind of create leverage with their other partners to keep up with their own demand. Okay, elevated hubris often brings down companies. Any signs of that excessive level of hubris that makes Amazon vulnerable? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Now I think, I think kind of modesty and humbleness is, a, is an Amazon value. They try to, they certainly try to articulate that value and the question is do they really embody it? Um, I, I don't know that, you know, that sort of excessive amb ambition is like going to be their problem. If anything, it's gonna be a lack of focus, trying too many things. Um, you know, we, we've seen that, I think, bring down a lot of companies. So I, I, I think, I think you know, in the spectrum of Silicon Valley companies, Amazon's probably on the more modest end. Okay, where do you see Amazon in 10 years? One-stop shop, what or who can keep them from taking over the world? Uh, that's a great question. Now, you know, t I, and I'll, again, I'll caveat it by saying 10 years ago, I never would have imagined the Amazon that we see today. The fact that Amazon has defined what could be the next paradigm of computing with Alexa is bonkers. By all reasonable measures, Google or Microsoft should have gotten to AI and, and, vo and voice computing first. They were both working on it. You know, Jeff saw the opportunity and started investing. Um, so who's to say what, you know, what the next 10 years will bring? You know, if I had to bet, I'd say, you know, international expansion, um, definitely a, f a further push into the Internet of Things, so trying to kind of really automate your home. Robotics has been a huge uh, um, source of, of uh, resources and attention. They do a robotics conference every year. They want to automate their warehouses. I suspect in 10 years they will be making more progress on that. And then I think, you know, antitrust attention is going to come. Amazon doesn't fit into the kind of natural and, and, and recent paradigm for antitrust. It's not a clear monopoly in nearly any, in most of all the businesses where it operates, except maybe for books. And so regulators are gonna kinda have to come up with a new antitrust framework to kind of attack Amazon. But considering the political environment around Silicon Valley companies, I think that they will, they will do that and Amazon, Amazon will get some of that negative attention. Okay, regarding Amazon's culture that hires and retains best talent, how is Jeff able to implement and influence this across so many branches, offices, and employees around the world? Well, that's a great question. I'm, I'm sure there are some Amazon uh, current or former employees here who can answer that, but the key is these 14 leadership principles. It's on the Amazon website, you can find them. It, it, these are like the principles of a religion. It's like the Old Testament of Amazon. It's a set of behaviors, including frugality, um, disagree and commit, invent and simplify that are not like at other companies just talking points. They drive every conversation from conversations around promotions to plans for new businesses. So Jeff, he spent an enormous amount of time cultivating those 14 values and in every conversation and all his behavior inside the company, he drives those values home and it kind of creates a unified set of core principles that this very distributed and now very large company with almost 700,000 employees, they all somewhat march in lockstep. 
Okay, Amazon leaving China didn't make much news and didn't make a discernible impact on the stock price. Was it really a non-event? So recently, Amazon closed down its consumer-facing Chinese business. It had been called, it had started with an acquisition of a startup called Joyo.com in the early 2000s, and they got demolished uh, by Alibaba and by JD.com. So it was a non-event in terms like they had negligible, negligible market share. But the fact is, Amazon has a, a huge business in China, not just at Amazon Web Services, but, but basically cross-border commerce. I think a hidden secret of the explosion in, uh, in selling, in third-party selling on Amazon.com and the explosion of use of fulfillment by Amazon has come from Chinese factories and manufacturers uh, basically shipping their products into American Amazon warehouses and, and Europe as well, putting their products in Amazon search, buying Amazon ads and selling to uh, US and European customers. So it was a non-event because they sold one part of their Chinese business, not the whole thing. Why can't Amazon get their hands around preventing fraudulent products, copies of originals sold on their platform? Yeah, recently they banned third-party sellers. Is that enough to ensure well, they didn't ban third-party sellers. They created kind of new tools for third-party sellers to and for brands to identify frauds. You know, this is something that basically impacts every marketplace, either a selling marketplace like, like eBay or a transportation marketplace like Uber. You always get people trying to take advantage. And the, cha the problem was Amazon, frankly, hadn't invested in policing counterfeits to the same extent that eBay learned a decade before it had to make those investments. So Amazon will, will catch up. They were too late and they and unfortunately allowed a lot of fraud on, on the system. Um, okay, well, let's end with this because what a great question. That's a great sport coat. Did you buy it on Amazon? I thank you, I bought it at Nordstrom's. I, I guess I'm an old-fashioned guy. Thank you, guys. <laughs>